Let us first proceed with an observation and then follow with a question. What would you do or what would you think in reference to mitigating a pandemic with a particular vaccine? So let us proceed as follows. Before I begin this article right now, just for the title, Longitudinal Analysis of SARS-CoV-2 Vaccine Breakthrough Infections Reveal Limited Infectious Virus Shedding and Restricted Tissue Distribution. What does that mean? So to proceed as follows, as we follows, as we scroll down and we rest on the first paragraph here. Interestingly, in two of the three viral culture negative individuals, for which we collected both saliva and nasal samples, viral RNA was detectable in saliva for five to 10 days. Keep in mind, these are vaccinated individuals five to 10 days while remaining either undetectable or detectable at very low level for two days in nasal swabs. To reiterate, detectable levels of viral RNA or in very low levels, if detectable or undetectable, I should say, was only available for two days in nasal swabs. So which is probably the most common testing method is nasal swabs. But however, though, in the vaccinated, and I mean only vaccinated, the viral RNA was detectable in saliva for five, at least according to the study, five to 10 days while remaining either undetectable. So we postulate an individual comes in, gets tested, uh, that has been vaccinated, and they use a procedure nasal swab, but yet they are carrying detectable levels of the viral RNA, just not in the nasal swab, it's in the saliva. To proceed, these data suggest that in two of the four fully vaccinated individuals for which both saliva and nasal swabs were collected, infection was initially, move this a second, was initially established within the oral cavity or other saliva exposed tissue site and was restricted from disseminating to the nasal passages, i.e. restricted from disseminating to the nasal passages. Quote, we did not observe a similar restriction of virus to saliva across 60 non-vaccinated individuals that we examined in the previous report. So this may be, a, if confirmed, a unique trait to individuals which are vaccinated. So basically the vaccine is given the impression potentially of a lower viral load in the nasal swabs or undetectable viral load. But reality, it is up there for five to 10 days in the saliva. Now that produces a conundrum, a couple of different ways. Number one, how was the test where the trials conducted on the vaccine efficacy. And two, what do you do now? To proceed down the article just a little further. Here we go. We also show that some breakthrough infections in fully vaccinated individuals may be tissue restricted and only detectable through saliva screening. The clinical implications of compartmentalization are that testing RT-PCR or antigen based on nasal swabs may underestimate the true number of breakthrough infections and that an important role of vaccine elicited immunity may be restricting viral dissemination and thus limiting symptom severity and transmission potential. These data also further support a role for the oral cavity or other saliva associated tissue sites as an initial site for SARS-CoV-2 infection prior dissemination and replication of the virus in the nasal passages in some individuals. So here you have individuals which are vaccinated, which are not necessarily showing a viral load in the nasal cavity, but are loaded with viral RNA DNA in the saliva. Doesn't have to take a lot of um, imagination to understand the dimensions of this problem if validated in future studies because if the vaccinated are not showing the virus in the nasal swabs, 
but it's in saliva. But yet we're testing utilizing nasal swabs. You can see the major flaw in the policy right off the bat. Not being anti-vaccine, pro-vaccine, I'm just looking at whether the vaccines that are presented to us uh, have not been mistakenly oversold. All right, let's get right into the data as follows. Ba -ba -bum. Again, that was from this research here. We'll have all the links ready uh, a little bit later on, but here we go. And we'll be covering uh, breathing humid and salt and rich air reduces respiratory drop of generation may contribute to the effectiveness of the cotton mask and reduce incidence and death by COVID-19 near seacoast. There is something about fresh ocean air, which is just incredibly invigorating and health fortifying. Symptoms, ba ba ba, reported with new onset of loss of taste and smell individuals with without SARS infection, the small ones, so let's just cover it real fast. It basically says, oh, however, in both groups with positive and negative test results, congestion or runny nose had a strong association with new loss of, new loss of taste and smell, suggesting the latter may not be a valid marker of test positivity in this sample. Meaning, they looked at other ailments, so on and so forth, and compared it to COVID. They found out the media sensationalization of loss of taste and smell uh, was fairly similar, uh, regardless of the infectious material, as long as a runny nose was involved. So that may shoot down another bias in reference to COVID. And what they're stating right here is not, I'm going to say the latter, not to just account loss of taste or smell as an indication of whether an individual had COVID-19 or not. That's not gonna be a good indicator since it basically anybody that has a runny nose or congestion will also at the same time too have equally likely chance of loss of taste or smell. Also too, keep in mind that zinc gets depleted fairly rapidly uh, when fighting infections. So henceforth, that could also lead to a loss of taste and smell by creating a zinc deficiency. To proceed, Prior exposure to common cold coronavirus to enhance immune response to SARS-CoV-2. We'll cover that, come back to that. Uh, vitamin D, smoking, gender. Yeah, I can tell you right off the bat what's, what's been correlated very, very uh, uh, kindly with vitamin D. Uh, basically, this one here. Uh, viral loads, Delta variant, SARS-CoV-2 breakthrough infections following vaccination and booster with BNT162B2. Let's get this one out of the way real fast as well. Quote, Let's make this a little larger so it's easier to read. All right, our results show that vaccine, that the vaccine is initially effective in reducing viral loads to Delta breakthrough infections with a magnitude of 15 fold. Average, let's just see if we can highlight this way. Average of over the first two months post vaccination, depending on the variant, consistent with its initial effectiveness against pre Delta variants. So this is the best of the best against the variants prior to Delta. However, this viral load effectiveness declines with time post-vaccination, significantly decreasing already after three months and effectively vanishing after about six months. All right, there's a title for that. We'll have the link there, but that'll give you an idea. So that's another reason why they're prior promoting boosters, but to proceed. Really good article on random on how many randomized trials have actually been conducted in reference to non-pharmaceutical interventions, otherwise known as NPIs. And we'll come back to that in a second. Not a lot. I mean, seriously, even though they play a huge role in people's lives on autonomy, uh, over the past year and a half, uh, they've, they haven't bothered doing much research at all on a randomized level. And a lot of the research that came out, like the Denmask study, which when you were come back to this, was one of the ones that were completed. And we discounted it because it didn't fit well with bureaucratic selection bias. To proceed as follows. Estimated U.S. infection based to induce SARS-CoV-0 prevalence based on blood donations. We'll just get this one out of the way real fast. All right, we're looking at right here. Do, 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 do. There it is. By May 2021, the combined infection and vaccination induced seroprevalence estimated increased to 83.3%. So that's with infection and vaccination. That's May 2021. So people had some sort of immune defense mounted either through exposure or vaccine by 83% by May 2021. 
Who knows what this is increased to? Does it all change by variant uh, per se? So, for example, if you resist the Delta variant, then you now it's resistant to the Delta variant, a natural immunity. We don't know, but otherwise, that pretty much says a lot about herd immunity. All right, to proceed forward. Our Basically, as our disclaimer, the VARES database, keep in mind, as it says right here, when we go to the VARES database, the adverse events and reports can be inaccurate, incomplete, so on and so forth. They're just people submitting data where basically they are attempting to find uh, patterns, safety signals. And that is a huge database, a huge database. In fact, let's look at that real fast. Here goes our data. This is the zip file size of the VARES report 2021. Up to this date, this is September 5th at 2.18 a.m. And by the way, good morning to our data analyst, scientists, bioinformatics, biostatisticians, epidemiologists, policymakers, and all our data-oriented crowd, just the same. Now, I'll be moving kind of fast, so please forgive me for talking really fast. But here we go. Give you an idea. This is the comparison. This is from up there. It goes back. All in 1990 to 2020. 30 years, 30 years of vaccine adverse event reporting. The file, the zip file is 122.51 megabytes. Just from January 2021 to now, 113.37 megabytes. And again, it looks almost exactly the same, just to give you an idea. But yeah, our the data collected, uh, the zip file size just for this year so far, is about the same size of all reports and vaccine reactions reported to VARES as the prior 30 years. That is just astounding as far as information is concerned. And I don't know how the CDC has the uh, personnel on hand to investigate the, f I mean, the incredible deluge of reports coming in. All right, but back to this, let's go. Do, 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 do. I will be using Udur Vigilance. Oh, this up. Uh, I apologize. Our World and Data is one of our data sources. Udur Vigilance is one of those uh, is our primary data source as well. But however, let's begin here. All right. This is important to look at. Cases per million. That's Israel right there. India. Now, one of the main pandemic mitigation strategies has obviously been vaccinations in which Israel has been very successful with this vaccination program. India, not so much. How much so? Let's look at, remember, this is the cases. But let's look at the vaccines. Here we go. Ba -ba 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 -ba. People, they, this is our world and data, people fully vaccinated. Israel, we have 62.64%. India, as you can see there, 11.19% of the population. Very successful vaccine campaign in Israel. Not so successful in India. But what's the whole objective? Reduction of COVID-19. In which case, heavily vaccinated Israel versus lightly vaccinated India. You draw the comparison. Again, this is not a lab study. And the objective here is to see how things are operating in the real world. And for whatever reason, uh, there could be confounding biases, so on and so forth. Um, yeah, there's 30 cases per million of COVID-19 in India compared to 1,143 cases per million in Israel. Number of people fully vaccinated. Again, these are sometimes tough things to look at. You see what I mean? That's all I have to show you. All right, and then our databases is fine. We'll look at this, this. Uh, by the way, the Janssen vaccine, 25,850 reports. Uh, AstraZeneca, 367,124. Uh, Pfizer's, 401,500. This is the European database. Uh, and then Moderna, 107,060. And we'll cover that in a second. I want to show you that for the fact checkers out there. That is the amount that they're showing per vaccine uh, for the reports for the European Union. And then we'll look at the data and that in a second as well. But let us begin with our first story, because this one's a good one. All right. Two parallel studies were conducted. One, a randomized four-arm study of 21 healthy human subjects. The researchers found 
that breathing of humid air and delivery of salt droplet size to, de uh, to deposit in the nose, trachea, and main bronchi reduce the exhalation, exhalation of respiratory droplets recognized to be a primary mode of transport of SARS-CoV-2. So something that could be used potentially as source control by approximately 50% within 10 minutes following hydration. The suppression then lasts for around one hour on return to dry air conditions. Now, however, though, if they used divalent calcium and magnesium salts, suppression continued for four to five hours. This clearing of respiratory droplets from the upper airways is similar to that achieved by wearing of cotton face masks. Food for thought. The next one, just as intriguing. In a second study, a preliminary ecological regression study of COVID-19 cases in the United States between January 2020 and March 2021, the authors found a correlation between exposure to elevated airborne salt concentration in locations along the U.S. Gulf and Pacific coastlines with strong inland-oriented wind patterns and suppression of COVID-19 incidents and deaths per capita relative, in, relative to inland counties by approximately 25 to 30%. Like ocean air, it dropped it that fast, this correlation-wise, to proceed. The natural and effective cleansing of the air we breathe is a balance between water and salt in the airways and the hydrated nature of the air itself. Breathing humid and salty air appears to promote upper airway cleansing and to be helpful practice in maintaining respiratory health in the face of challenges to breathing clear air today. Now we add that to our arsenal of pandemic mitigation tools, which be wonderful if it became implemented because of non-invasive and allow for autonomy or self-determination as opposed to mask and vaccine. So imagine if we would have chose the course and came to the realization that basically there's a lot of mutations going on and the vaccine may not be fully effective and we said, hey, since, since this is basically a brand new virus and it's mutating rapidly, why don't we try UVC222? UVC 254, ionization, ozonation, UVB, because sunlight works really well, uh, deactivation as well, and now ocean air. You can really, really have built a major pandemic firewall if we basically said, hey, not that you're discounting COVID or whatever it is, just saying, hey, you know, the tools that we have available right now, the ones that we could use, which aren't going to mess people's days up, like even UVC 222 in restaurants and stadiums and so on and so forth, uh, are viable, effective, inexpensive, and relatively harmless. And wow, we could have had an incredibly advanced, highly technical um, pandemic mitigation strategy, which could work for basically any pandemic per se. Again, on a general basis. Who knows whatever happens if UVC or UVB is going to have the same impact, but at least in reference to coronaviruses, you know, that was pretty cool. And now fresh ocean air, that's even cooler. All right, let us begin. Next one. Symptoms reported. Uh, we went through this, the runny nose. It did, again, media bias uh, or biases that could be projected through um, assumptions uh, from initial reports can sometimes take hold and they could affect actually how things are diagnosed. But when the research was published here in JAMA, they said, you know, it's really the runny nose and the congestion that has the strongest association with loss of smell and taste, like most colds and flus, per se. All right, proceed forward. Prior exposure, talking about colds, prior to exposure to common cold coronavirus to enhance immune response to SARS-CoV-2. This was, again, we covered this a little bit, but let's reiterate it on this new study because it's a really, really good uh, foundation. They were the first report that individuals with the researchers here, the first report that individuals with no prior exposure to SARS-CoV-2, nonetheless, had immunological memory cells capable of recognizing the novel virus. Remember in the very beginning, when all of us were here, 
they said that there was no natural immunity to SARS-CoV-2. And then it got quiet. And, you know, because, you know, there was a lot of fear in the beginning, understandably so. But it was based upon no natural immunity, nor they also made the claim that nor could you develop natural immunity against SARS-CoV-2. And that was a really, really dangerous assumption, which probably sent us off on the wrong tangent. The researchers concluded that these T helper cells, not stating antibodies per se, they're saying T helper cells because everyone's looking at antibodies. Now, again, we go back to the very first article uh, in reference to detecting you know, SARS-CoV-2 in the nasal passageways and things like that. You can see where a lot of confusion begins. Must have been generated to deal with mostly harmless common cold virus, mostly, mostly, uh, coronaviruses. And thanks to the structural similarities between coronaviruses, remember it's 228 AM, so I'm going to mispronounce some words. In particular, the characteristic spike protein found on the outer surface, these T helper cells, T helper cells, will also attack the novel coronavirus. This cross reactivity hypothesis has since been confirmed by a range of studies. So they also allude to, not necessarily in this article here, but before with school children, I think we did, uh, we looked at it about a week, couple of weeks ago, that kids are now being, it sounds wrong, but deprived of the exposure to the common colds, flus, and sniffles they usually get when they congregate in school for the first time, first grade, second grade, so on and so forth. So by them not uh, being exposed to the common cold viruses and such, uh, that can have a how would you say, not necessarily a detrimental aspect, but it could deprive the immune system of training in a much more controlled environment. So when nasty stuff does come around, uh, they could be better prepared. And so you get an idea there. All right, proceed, but you're, you get what the drift is. It's common cold uh, exposure, does have a little bit of cross reactivity, and it's been confirmed in multiple studies now. When in the beginning, they said no, but I don't know why they said no. Maybe they just didn't know the right question to ask. All right, to proceed forward. SARS-2-2 antibody to three months post-vaccination. This is really just giving you a validation in reference to the correlation of vitamin D. Uh, it says replete vitamin D levels were associated with higher antibody teeters. Uh, really good p-value if you're into that or confidence intervals. Conclusion, age, male, sex, and smoking negatively affects male sex, male sex. Effect, uh, uh, negatively affects antibody teeter, while vitamin D is associated with increased, increased SARS-CoV-2 antibody teeters. So that's a nice little correlation in reference to vitamin D, also helping uh, with antibodies in reference to vaccinations, uh, keeping them elevated most likely. Proceed. And then here we go here. This is the one viral loads, the Delta Variant SARS-CoV-2 breakthrough infections following vaccination and booster with the BNT162B2 vaccine. And we came down here, and this is important. Our results show that the vaccine is initially effective in reducing viral loads of Delta breakthrough infections with a magnitude of 15-fold, consistent with its initial effectiveness against pre-Delta variants. However, this viral load effectiveness declines with time post-vaccination significantly decreasing already after three months and effectively vanishing after six months. That was pre-Delta and now Delta comes along. So again, so when they look at boosters and things like that, this is why a lot of countries are saying you have to have the vaccine at a certain point of time before traveling. Uh, provided the vaccine efficacy is there, uh, but now it's it's just getting kind of silly because right now it looks like in order to maintain, if you rely upon the vaccine uh, for immune immunological defense, then you be getting vaccinated a lot. Let's just put it that way. At least at least maybe, well, if it vanishes, it vanishes at six months. It looks like once every four months. So vaccinated maybe three times a year if you want to rely solely upon the vaccine as an immunological support structure. I don't know, again, but it looks like that. To proceed. Randomized trials uh, on non-pharmaceutical interventions of COVID-19 as of August, 2021. 
So what the researcher alluded to here is that after all this time, close to about two years, there are very few randomized trials to see what these non-pharmaceutical interventions are, whether they're working or not, i.e. social distancing, lockdowns, school closures, etc. All right. And the ones which were published, the seven that were completed were as follows. You ready for this? You see, this is a global event and, you know, not that I would expect more, you know, especially since it was a massive loss of autonomy and self-determination. China, self-made gastroscope mask for patients, face mask for adults. That's the Denmark study. And we all know how the Denmark study turned out, and it's only it's one of the only seven completed randomized trials. And I don't know how much attention was actually paid to it because face masks are still being mandated. Uh, access to indoor fitness centers for adults, yoga as general fitness practice, one of the ones were actually completed. Facebook ads for adults, another high priority COVID uh, randomization trial that needed to be completed. Access to indoor music and events for adults, I can see that. Daily testing of contact cases for an isolated cases, and we all know how these turn out. Uh, but after they are published, they somehow become immediately ignored. And the rest are ongoing, but that's it. After a year and a half, that's all that's been completed. And so, you know, they're not... Once there's a bureaucratic ideology established, and that type of uh, clerisy is incorporated it just seems to uh, fall flat but to proceed as follows go to the next one da, da, da. all right and here we go and per se all right this is doo, doo, doo. here we go da, da. estimated u.s infections of vaccine induced sars cov 2 seroprevalence based on blood donations july 2020 to may 2021 and this was the conclusion as follows and here we proceed it goes da, 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 by May 2021, the combined infection and vaccination induced seroprevalence estimated an increase to 83.3%. 83.3%. Look, hang on one second, one second. So there you see, by May 2021, the combined infection and vaccination induced seroprevalence estimated an increase to 83.3%. So what this is implying basically is herd immunity. Now you're doing combined infection and vaccination. And this is May. Now we're in September. So you know this number is obviously going to be far higher. But again, depending on uh, variants and so on and so forth. Uh, how When you're talking about herd immunity, what are you talking about herd immunity to? Uh, alpha variant, delta variant, coronavirus as a whole. Uh, have we developed herd immunity to the common cold yet? Uh, is there an animal reservoir? You, know, you hear that debated quite a bit and so on and so forth, where is even herd immunity even possible? Uh, it's going to be endemic. But we were at 83% in May. So just keep that in mind. All right, next as follows. Now we're going to go to our data. Here is a disclaimer to the various database we discovered before. And here we go. Let's begin. Do, do, do. There's a zip file size. We went there. Let's go to various. All right, and when Varus pops up here, all right, right off the bat, so we don't have to cover it again. Uh, the reports, which are Y associated, meaning we have 6,280 reports of mortality submitted to the Varus database as of, I believe it was August 23rd. But there are some anomalies in the Varus database, which we'll discuss in a second. Let's begin. Do, 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 do. All right, we had 3,682 reports of serva. There's the average age to the side if you want to look at that. All right, 13,697 reports of shingles. Again, all needs to be ver verified in these reports to, not reported from. 5,533 cases of Bell's palsy. All right, and then when you look at the Ys here, this is how we count the mortality. This is for the other data analysts out there. Don't have to worry about word search, just count the Ys. And that's how we end up with the 6,200 plus reports uh, because that's the correlation. Reported thrombocytopenia reactions by age, 2,994. Uh, paralysis by age, 4,625. Myocarditis. I see a lot of reports out there playing down, saying, oh, there's only been one or two reactions to 
the, the VARES database, whatever it is. Now, keep in mind, they have to be validated. But all the same, that's being reported to is a lot more than 30 or 40, as they allude to, uh, being reported to the database. Now, what's validated, it could be a different, uh, different scenario. But the second thing, too, is myocarditis in the general population tends to run a little older and not so young. So don't shrug it off as of yet because this number there was popping up quite early at a low, much lower uh, area as far as the average within the average age. And you see outliers over here, too. Uh, thrombosis, 7,194. COVID illness reactions by age, I guess breakthrough would assume, uh, 68,766. Uh, duplicative errors IDs going down, 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 down. Uh, vaccine reactions reported two errors at 512,090 uh, by age. And then this is the mortality uh, in the vaccine reports. Submitted two VARES, not VARES validating, but submitted two VARES in the reports. Let's see. These are the uh, mortality by week. No unusual spikes outside of what happened here in April. Um, something interesting here when we look at this. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Vaccine reports. I don't know whether the data was dumped into the VARES, being like, for example, someone had a bunch of paperwork they all submitted at once. Or it could be because the beginning of the school season. You'll see what I mean in a second. There's the rolling seven LC. All of a sudden, these reports started coming flying in towards, I don't know why, but they started coming in towards August. Look here. This is your vaccine reactions compared to 2020. Uh, 2021, and we're not even done yet, but we did the whole comparison. This is all, This is pretty much the uh, almost equivalent to the past 30 years, as we did in the beginning. Going down. Do, 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 do. Most common reactions reported. Top 30 symptoms reported by age. Uh, a lot of them are superfluous and easy to recover from, but still just the same. This is the top 30 across the entire board. Um, this is obviously mortality. And there's our, our mortality, for example, most common causes of mortality. Uh, vaccine reaction by ages. I'll go back to the mortality real, real fast. We want to hold that. There, see COVID-19, a lot of it. I don't know why, but it's the most common thing mentioned in the mortality reports. So again, you could speculate in reference to how. Uh, vaccine reaction reports by day and week. You see the spike all of a sudden there? Again, this is um, in minors. So that's what meant. Maybe it was the beginning of the school year that caused that spike. I don't know. Uh, problems with lot numbers or lot numbers associated with the most reports. Again, this could be a huge lot. We don't know. So it could be lower percentage compared to it. But I'm just going by count, not by percentage. Um, children, most common reactions tend to be chest pain, chest discomfort. But if you add up all the chest stuff right off the bat, chest pain, chest discomfort, uh, you're going to end up with these two here and here. Uh, could be... Uh, almost chest pain or discomfort almost tied to number one. All right, and then we go down the list here, and I think that up reports, now we're going to look at that. Adverse reports by week, and I think we're pretty much covered on that. The rest is for me on that. All right, let's go to mutations. This is going to be interesting. So I want to give you an idea how fast mutations spread, but first let's look at the rest. All right, here we go. Come on, heat map, go smaller there. All right, correlations. Now, keep in mind, there's a lot of things you could confound as being correlations. So if you look at total boosters per 100, all of a sudden you see this 0.94. And that's a real, and we're using the Pearson coefficient. So this is 0.94 with the Pearson coefficient. Now, now, boosters correlating with the amount of people being administered to the hospital or in ICU admissions per, per million. Now, these could be people that are in the hospital receiving boosters, not necessarily boosters sending them to the hospital. So I don't know. I don't know. But 0.94 is an incredible correlation. Uh, cases smooth per million, boosters per 100. Uh, remember, you're counting Israel and places like that where they're already doing the boosters. Uh, for the general population, again, uh, I don't know. 
remember the, the booster is coming towards the tail end, so it could throw a little co-founding in there. But if you look at that, you don't really see anything as far as negative correlations. And you don't see really anything as far as people vaccinated per 100 being a correlation of any significance, except uh, to the total boosters per 100, which is really weird. Uh, you know, it's just not there. So again, it's looking for correlations. This is a, this is a heat map for those not familiar. And we're using Pearson's uh, method Pearson in this one. And just not just not seeing it. And so, again, I'm not seeing the vaccines having any solid um, influence on positive rate uh, or, or anything. So you see what I mean? That's just to look at, food for thought. Uh, the world, people fully vaccinated per 100 correlated to total cases per million. I'm not going to say anything. That's your correlation. Uh, total cases per million. Again, the blue is the people vaccinated per 100. Red is the total cases per million. Uh, the y-axis right here represents the people fully vaccinated per 100. And of course, the y-axis over here represents total cases per million. Um, mortality for the world. All right, we got that. Keep, should keep an eye on this bar here. This bar represents the current cases per million correlation. We're looking at countries which are heavily vaccinated, more than 40 per 100 vaccinated, at the Human Development Index of 0.64 or greater. All right, using the Our World and Data database. Here we go. So there's your cases per million. These are your countries. You see right there. This is your uh, vaccinated per 100, the y-axis weeded out there. And for example, there's the United States and there's Belgium and Canada and so on and so forth. These are cases per million. And yes, 120,000 plus cases per million is accurate. Uh, again, cumulative. So there we are there. And then mortality is about one and a half per million. So keep that number in mind if you can. That's probably the one advantage in, in the countries which are highly heavily vaccinated. They do tend to have a little bit lower mortality. But there's some interesting confounding here. All right, now we go for countries less than 40 per 100 vaccinated. There are less cases per million. These are your countries. They are right here. Uh, this is your new death smooth per million. See, it's about a little higher there, about maybe uh, 1.5 higher, one and a half uh, people per million mortality, um, as opposed to, you know, close to 30 people per uh, you know, 100 vaccinated. Then we go down. Now we go down to 20 people vaccinated or under. Or under. That's where the heavily vaccinated countries are. There's your marker. They're at 40,000 cases per million. And basically the vaccination rate is close to about 18. All right. Remember, this is your heavily vaccinated countries, cases per million. This is where this particular... A set is under under 20 so basically 19 or under here we go and these are our countries there's india indonesia lebanon so on and so forth as we go down let's go down to the 10 under 10 vaccinated per 100 there is our cases per million now no that's this is our case per million take that back this is our cases per million in the heavily vaccinated countries. This is our cases per million in the non-heavily vaccinated countries. A big portion of reference to controls. You know that. So basically, since the vaccines really have not taken hold in these countries, there's either a counting issue or there's a vaccine issue. So there's either a testing issue, per se, or there's been counting, or there's a vaccine issue. Now, I'm, not, I'm not the one to decide. But however, though, Whatever it is, uh, in the countries which are heavily vaccinated, I would expect to see cases per million uh, to be lower than the countries which are not heavily vaccinated. But that's not the case. And there's our countries. Um, and there is basically our cases per million. All right. And so let's proceed down the line. Make this a little smaller so you can see it. There is our 
40 to 100. There's a 21 to 39. There's 11 to 20. And there is our 0 to 10. All right. And there we go down the line. There's your up here. We're going to go to the, we're going to compare the United States now to Sweden and India. Again, a correlation to see is, if is the United States pandemic mitigation strategy more effective than loose lockdown Sweden or no vaccine India. Are you ready? Here we begin. New deaths per million, USA, four and a half. Positive rate, United States, 0.14. Fully vaccinated, close to 190 million. We covered that. All right, and so there we are. Uh, this just stands for the variant, which is primarily Delta. Here's a fully vaccinated population. Now we're going to compare it to India. You already know where this is going to go. India, new deaths per million, about zero. What is the United States? 4.5. What was the one thing the vaccine was supposed to be preventing? Mortality. In a real world setting, comparative wise, not taking into account extreme confounding, uh, just observation between the two uh, graphs, that would be highly questionable. Positivity rate in India, 0 0.02. What is the positivity rate in the United States? 0 0.14. 0 0.14 versus 0 0.02 around there. Again, you're the judge, not I. Fully vaccinated population. Sweden. We won't go back to the United States because I think you already got the numbers down. Deaths per million. Remember, they weren't masking that much or they weren't, you know, locking things down. Australia, pay attention. Um, and where are they at? Positivity rate, Sweden, low. Vaccination rate, up there. But lockdown methods, did it make a difference? I don't know. Remember, Sweden was supposed to fall off the face of the earth. Then some very famous doctor said they were Scandinavian during a congressional uh, hearing. And um, I don't know where it went with that. All right. And then we continue down. Now watch this. See the green here? That's our variance. That's Delta. So that's 100. But I want to show you how fast Delta spread. This is what we do as far as determining, um, for example, different variants. If, uh, what I decide, yeah, let's say, for example, Loda's beginning to rise. It's in the United States, 0.01% of the U.S. has a sequence of Loda. All right, but otherwise, it would look at everything for what it's at, for what it is. There it is. But watch this. You see this 100% here? Let's go all the way down. And these are all the variants and so on and so forth. I don't want to give you a time lapse thing. But let's just go back down to, whoops, I must hit Delta on here by accident. Let's go back down to April 19th. Let's isolate Delta. There we are. It's way up there in India. So India was the first to be exposed to Delta months ago. And we all know where India is right now. And then all of a sudden, within five months, it's at 100%. And these countries, where if you take like the United States right here, at 100% Delta, where was the United States and Delta back there? It was, I can't even get it on there, almost non-existent. What did you say, like 1%, almost, whoop, yeah, 0.3%. So if they, from April 19th, 2021 to now, it went from 0.3%, 0.3, to virtually 100%, except for Loda, which is hanging around somewhere in the United States. But still, you get the idea. And that's just uh, there. And let's see. Anything else? Da 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 da. All right, we did. Let's go to the Europe database, European database. Let's look at their vaccine uh, adverse event reports. All right. This is what we have. Back up there. 901,534 vaccine adverse reports reported to uh, basically the Eurodura Vigilance. Of that, that's Janssen. That's to give you the number we looked at earlier. AstraZeneca, Pfizer, so 401,500 for Pfizer, 367,124 for AstraZeneca, Moderna, 1,638, 91,534 reports total. 
in the database with reports submitted to them with a fatal designation, 14,428. Most common reaction, it's interesting because it's a little different than the United States, it is going to be chills, joint pain, headache, fatigue, and so on and so forth. These are serious reactions. Serious reactions. I take that back. These are just the serious reactions. And so there we are on that. And I want to see if there's anything else yet. Yeah, these are the um, the the, more, the rarer ones, but yeah, but serious reactions right here. So chills and joint pain and so on and so forth, just to give you an idea. And again, the data that we use to compile that database was, you see it right there, remember we did in the beginning? So that's where we're getting that information to determine the number of reactions in the uh, Dura Vigilance as being 91,534 when you add up those four vaccines to total. All right, and then we go to do, 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 COVID Rebuild, and this is bigger states. And let's see what we have here. Ah, no, let's do this one first. This is the average age, for example, of mortality. This is gonna throw you a little off because I'm gonna have to clear out these, uh, these ages here. For example, see 15 to 24, then you have 18 to 29, you see how you see how they uh, they bleed in, so it gives you a, a false impression. Uh, but otherwise, if you look at the primary ones here, 85 to 75 to 84, 65 to 74, 50 to 64, you can see the age distribution pretty clearly. And again, this is me trying to clean up their database, uh, and that's only part of their database per se. But you get an idea. And let's just wrap it up as a night for now, and just to give you a good comparison of what's going on. Uh, just because you should, you have a right to know. And thankfully, we've been permitted to uh, inform you of uh, what's been going on, uh, albeit not a very popular channel, but still just the same, a great audience. So we covered the databases, boom, boom, boom. We covered the fact that generally that we can't seem to show any correlation between vaccine efficacy on a global scale as opposed to vaccine efficacy that they've confirmed in their trials. So something uh, doesn't, uh, there's gotta be confounding. That's anything dishonest is occurring, but obviously there's some confounding there. Uh, we found out, ba -ba -ba, we looked at uh, the seroprevalence that basically back in May, 83% of the population either had some exposure to um, some, some seroprevalence either through uh, natural immunity and or vaccination by that time, 83.3%. We discovered that no one's been doing any really solid randomized trials and the ones that we have done uh, seem to be, uh, be, have become ignored, uh, but you expect since it's a global event, you have more trials being conducted. So we could be better prepared for next time, but nope. All right, let's see viral loads. Um, Find out from the studies here that basically after six months, um, at least pre-Delta, you know, and that was that we had some defense against. Uh, I know you hear it sometimes numbers which are much further out, but the, the researchers here are saying it vanishes after six months. So take it for what it's worth. All right, and there is that. Um, vitamin D still correlating for even with a good vaccine response. Uh, prior exposure. Colds seem to have, uh, again, uh, counter to popular belief, uh, seem to have uh, some impact in reference to uh, SARS-CoV-2 mitigation. Um, symptoms of loss of taste and smell, uh, that could have been a, a bias that somehow took hold in the very beginning when we didn't know what was going on and the media kind of hung on to it. And then everyone started wondering if they lost the taste of the sense of smell, that it must be COVID. But was anybody paying attention to, you know, all the other elements out there for so many years about lost taste of, taste of smell? Um, yeah, I don't know. But according to the research here from the JAMA, it's more associated with runny nose and congestion. All right, and then my favorite one, fresh ocean air a little salt in the air with a little moisture. Seems to have a very, very, uh, how would you say, gratuitous effect on the mitigation of COVID-19, uh, especially when compared to inland counties. 
And, uh, and if this works, for example, on suppression, I wonder how it works in prevention of infection uh, from, an, from an individual as far as preventing a person potentially spreading it uh, per se. But it's wonderful, wonderful information, which is really, really, really cool. All right, guys, it is now 2.58 a.m. It's turning around the corner to three. Gratitude, thank you. Again, remember it's 4K. It takes a while to render to 4K. But in the meantime, while it's rendering to 4K, I will link up all the studies for you to look at. And as always, gratitude, thank you. And gratitude and just humble for everything else that you guys allowed me to do so far. That's been great. As far as being able to get the information out there in a uh, non-hostile uh, format, i.e., uh, fact checking out of existence. We do get fact checked, but all our P's and Q's, T's and Q's, T's and Q's are P's and Q's are crossed. Whatever it is, it's crossed. It's 258. It's all crossed. But thank you for listening, and I'll catch you guys in a bit. See you then. Bye.